More than 200 films have been adapted from author Fyodor Dostoevsky's texts. Among them, ones deemed exceptionally significant were made by directors with different national backgrounds. These screen translations are believed to bring fresh perspectives to Dostoevsky's classic works. For example, take Akira Kurosawa's The Idiot. He updated Dostoevsky's 19th century drama. The Japanese director set his version in the Far East during modern times. Scholars say it became a statement about Japan's post-war trauma. According to reviews, the sense of isolation that is present in the original source is well portrayed in the film. That's despite the cultural difference. And in turn, it's this authentic quality that got it called the idiot's best adaptation. Writing about internal conflicts of characters was important for Dostoevsky. But how do you make a visually striking movie about that? Director Robert Wien used German expressionist cinema to convey such emotions. Raskolnikov, his production from 1923 is a silent adaptation of Crime and Punishment. Critics believe, despite its lack of sound, the film makes a worthy, if avant-garde, exploration of Dostoevsky's themes of morality and criminality. Alexei, I see in myself the same depravity and sin as there is in our father. I'm a Karamaz. And when talking about Dostoevsky adaptations, we need to mention Hollywood's handling of the Russian wordsmith. The American production of the Brothers Kermazov from 1958 is one of the most famous screen adaptations of the book. And it's told in classic Hollywood narrative fashion. Reviews point out that the film tends to lean on melodrama much more than the book. But it should be noted that this was a time when the melodrama genre was popular with audiences in the U.S. Yet, the book's important themes of family and redemption are still in the foreground of the movie. And despite dividing critics, the motion picture did reach the top of the U.S. box office. Some of these international adaptations take Dostoevsky's characters out of Russia. They put them in various regions of the world. And despite their different film styles and cultural codes, the adaptations stay true to Dostoevsky's vision. And to one degree or another, received acclaim. This, in turn, shows themes in his books, like guilt, ethics, and morality, are universal regardless of geography, and that Dostoevsky's way of conveying these human emotions is without borders. Dostoevsky is not the father of everything, but it's not very Let's speak to Professor Frederick White, who wrote Border Crossing, Russian Literature into Film. Hi there. So tell us, why do filmmakers love to adapt Dostoevsky texts so much? I mean, what's so attractive about these texts? Yeah, I, th I think that in uh, Dostoevsky's text, he is looking at kind of these larger universal questions that can easily be adapted to other places, other times, and other cultures. Um, does the great man have the uh, right to transgress law uh, to better society does, uh, if there is no God, uh, then are all things permissible? These are, are big questions that can be adapted to almost any uh, society, any time, and any place. And is this adaptability or these universal themes he's tackling, is this about the way he writes, the topics he's uh, handling, or is this something else, I mean, about uh, the way he approaches literature? Yes, well, Dostoevsky takes a much more, we would now say, psychological approach. Um, yet, uh, I think it's also the way in which he frames many of these questions. Um, it's often within the context of murder or human degradation. There's elements of humiliation. Uh, and uh, so there is this kind of universal quality even to these psychological elements of the story. So you have the big questions that 
uh, a movie may want to address, but you also have them kind of in an intriguing packaging, if you will. Uh, and so it, it's a good combination, I think, uh, for filmmakers who want to adapt a literary text. I mean, but when you look at it, uh, he basically wrote about internal conflicts, about, uh, you know, problematic characters. So in that sense, it could be challenging or intimidating for filmmakers to uh, make a visually striking movie about that. Sure. Um, I think, though, what we have to remember is adaptation is not supposed to, supposed to be a direct kind of mirror of the text. A good adaptation um, helps your uh, viewer both see maybe 19th century Russia, if that's the context for the adaptation, uh, but also to reflect on uh, current situation, the, the current human condition, right? So um, I would say that Dostoevsky gives you all of the tools uh, that you can kind of uh, use to create a really good adaptation. And you don't necessarily have to uh, place the story in 19th century Russia. You can bring it to contemporary times and still look at some of these questions. Yeah, I mean, it's what happens, right? I mean... Uh... And when it is uh, placed in different contexts, I mean, I think it's interesting that concepts such as freedom and revolution, which are quite specific in the Russian contexts, are not always synonymous. That's exactly right. Um, when we think about freedom in the American context, it's certainly not the same as the Russian or the French. And so Dostoevsky was writing in the 19th century about the larger political and social and religious questions of his time. What's interesting is he provides an answer maybe uh, for his time, but, but it leaves it open then to any filmmaker who wants to re-engage with these questions to kind of update the answer and even maybe update the question. Uh, and so uh, what, what is compelling then is if you see a French version of say crime and punishment or you, you see a American version uh, of crime and punishment, it's very often contingent to both uh, the country that made it, because they have their own kind of network of, of meanings, um, but also the time in which it was made. And all these adaptations, how do they influence the way we see uh, the original text? I mean, I think it's really hard to read uh, Dostoevsky's White Knights, for example, without uh, remembering Visconti's film adaptation. Absolutely. And I think this is the interesting element of adaptation studies for those of us that, that look at these kind of questions. Over time, especially if the original text has many versions, filmic versions, it becomes hard to only think about the text. Uh, you have to start looking at both the text and the other films that were made along the way. And so Visconti's uh, film is a perfect example. Any filmmaker that comes to White Knights now to create a new adaptation cannot just look at Dostoevsky's text. Uh, the filmmaker is going to have to look at Visconti's film and, and some others uh, because there's already a new vocabulary, if you will, uh, that's being established around that original text. Okay. I know this question might annoy a, a scholar, but still, what is your favorite Dostoevsky adaptation, film adaptation? Yeah, I don't know if I have one favorite. I do find compelling um, some of the different versions of Crime and Punishment. I mean, Crime and Punishment's first adaptation was in 1909, and then there's been uh, nearly 40 different film versions. And there's kind of three that stand out. There's the 1935 version uh, with Joseph von Sternberg and starring uh, Peter Lorre. Uh, and this is interesting because they replace the kind of the philosophical basis of the film uh, to really uh, reframe criminality within the context of Cesar Lombroso, which I find kind of interesting. Um, we also have uh, Robert Brisson's uh, 1959 version in which he uh, actually makes the crime uh, pickpocketing. Uh, and he's not so much interested in necessarily uh, contextualizing the, the text as he is in kind of uh, engaging again with this kind of philosophical question or the human condition. And then, of course, there's the 1970 version by uh, Yev Kulijanlov uh, that is quite fascinating because uh, it really captures the visual and kind of psychological textures 
of the text itself. Um, but you know, each one of these films is interesting also because we're looking at Hollywood in the 1930s or France in the 1950s or the Soviet Union in the 1970s. All right. Well, unfortunately, this is all the time we have. But thanks a lot, Professor Frederick White, for speaking to us today. Okay.